It is a truth universally acknowledged that a reader in possession of a good book must be in want of another. If that sounds like you, come along with me as I explore my bookshelves, read you stories, talk to authors, and chat about all the books as we search for our next great read. Grab your favorite book, a cup of tea, and settle in for the greatest adventures ever imagined. Welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. This is the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Art. Thank you for joining back with me again today. There's a big episode ahead today. We're going to finish up reading The Grey Woman by Elizabeth Gaskell. We have reached part three, and it is the conclusion of the story, and we will find out what happens to Anna and Amante. They're hiding in a barn in a mill, and they're on the run for their lives. And then we have a very special guest with us today as well, Dr. Diane Duffy, who is from the Gaskell Association, also has done research and volunteered at the Gaskell House, and she will be our guest. I'll have her on after the story, because we do talk about spoilers a bit of for the story. If you want to jump right to her interview, you can check out the chapter notes and uh, find out, and, and there's a timestamp. You can just click that and get right over to the interview first. I've had a great week of reading, and I've been preparing for uh, what is called Victober. It's an event that takes place in October. Victober is a readathon started by several booktubers on YouTube, and I, I don't know how long ago it started, but I've been a part of that community, and I've been reading along with them on their challenges over the past few years. This will be the first year where I am actually a booktuber and a podcaster, and I'll be participating in that. If you want more information about what booktube is and what I'll be reading in October for that uh, book challenge, you can go over to the uh, Bookshelf Odyssey YouTube page, and I have a video there that talks about it. You'll just see the Victober videos. Uh, but it's a lot of fun. I love Victorian literature, so this is right right up my alley. I have a lot of books planned to read that I have not read yet. One I am rereading is going to be A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, one of my favorite books. It meets one of the Victober challenges. So uh, I'm going to read that, and actually I'm going to do the audiobook version of it. Uh, it's read by Simon Callow, who is a phenomenal narrator, beautiful voice, and I'm really excited to see what he's going to do with that story. Again, for more information on that, head over to the YouTube channel, and you'll find the vi the appropriate videos there for you. Okay, today we are coming to the conclusion of The Grey Woman a story I have greatly enjoyed reading for you this past month. When we left off Anna and Amante, they were running from her husband. They were lost for a while. They are out in the rain. It is cold. It is dark. They are without help. These two are not going to wait around for a man to come and save them. Let's find out and see how they get out of the scrape they're in. As we enjoy The Gray Woman. By Elizabeth Gaskell. Portion 3. Far on in the night, there were voices outside, reached us in our hiding place. An angry knocking at the door, and we saw through the chinks the old woman rouse herself up to go and open it for her master, who came in evidently half drunk. To my sick horror, he was followed by Lefebvre, apparently as sober and wily as ever. They were talking together as they came in, disputing about something, but the miller stopped the conversation to swear at the old woman for having fallen asleep, and with tipsy anger and even with blows, drove the poor old creature out of the kitchen to bed. Then he and Lefebvre went on talking about the Sieur de Poissy's disappearance. It seemed that Lefebvre had been out all day, along with other of my husband's men, ostensibly assisting in the search, in all probability trying to blind the Sieur de Poissy's followers by putting them on the wrong scent, and also, I fancied, from one or two of Lefebvre's slight questions, combining the hidden purpose of discovering us. Although the miller was tenant and vassal to the Sieur de Poissy, 
He seemed to me to be much more in league with the people of Monsieur de la Tourelle. He was evidently aware, in part, of the life which Lefebvre and the others led, although again I do not suppose he knew or imagined one half of their crimes. And also, I think, he was seriously interested in discovering the fate of his master, little suspecting Lefebvre of murder or violence. He kept talking to himself and letting out all sorts of things and opinions, watched by the keen eyes of Lefebvre gleaming out below his shaggy eyebrows. It was evidently not the cue of the latter to let out that his master's wife had escaped from that vile and terrible den, but though he never breathed a word relating to us, not the less was I certain he was thirsting for our blood and lying in wait for us at every turn of events. Presently he got up and took his leave, and the miller bolted him out and stumbled off to bed. Then we fell asleep and slept sound and long. The next morning when I awoke, I saw Amante half raised, resting on one hand and eagerly gazing with straining eyes into the kitchen below. I looked too and both heard and saw the miller and two of his men eagerly and loudly talking about the old woman, who had not appeared as usual to make the fire in the stove and prepare her master's breakfast and who now, late on in the morning, had been found dead in her bed. Whether from the effect of her master's blows the night before, or from natural causes, who can tell? The miller's conscience unbraided him a little, I should say, for he was eagerly declaring his value for his housekeeper, and repeating how often she had spoken of the happy life she led with him. The men might have had their doubts, but they did not wish to offend the miller, and all agreed that the necessary steps should be taken for a speedy funeral. And so they went out, leaving us in our loft, but so much alone, that, for the first time almost, we ventured to speak freely, though still in a hushed voice, pausing to listen continually. Amante took a more cheerful view of the whole occurrence than I did. She said that, had the old woman lived, we should have had to depart that morning, and this quiet departure would have been the best thing we could have had to hope for, as, in all probability, the housekeeper would have told her master of us and of our resting place, and this fact would, sooner or later, have been brought to the knowledge of those from whom we most desired to keep it concealed. But now that we had time to rest and a shelter to rest in, during the first hot pursuit which we knew to a fatal certainty was being carried on, the remnants of our food and the stored-up fruit would supply us with provision. The only thing to be feared was that something might be required from the loft, and the miller or someone else mount up in search of it. But even then, with a little arrangement of boxes and chests, one part might be so kept in shadow that we might yet escape observation. All this comforted me a little. But, I asked, how were we ever to escape? The ladder was taken away, which was our only means of descent. But Amante replied that she could make a sufficient ladder of the rope, lying coiled among other things, to drop us down the ten feet or so, with the advantage of its being portable, so that we might carry it away and thus avoid all betrayal of the fact that any one had ever been hidden in the loft. During the two days that intervened before we did escape, Amante made good use of her time. She looked into every box and chest during the man's absence at his mill and finding in one box an old suit of man's clothes, which had probably belonged to the miller's absent son, she put them on to see if they would fit her. And when she found that they did, she cut her own hair to the shortness of a man's, made me clip her black eyebrows as close as though they had been shaved, and by cutting up old corks into pieces such as would go into her cheeks, she altered both the shape of her face and her voice to a degree which I should not have believed possible. All this time I lay like one stunned, my body resting and renewing its strength, but I myself in an almost idiotic state, else surely I could not have taken the stupid interest which I remember I did in all Amante's energetic preparations for disguise. I absolutely recollect once the feeling of a smile coming over my stiff face as some new exercise of her cleverness proved a success. But towards the second day she required me too, to exert myself. And then all my heavy despair returned. 
I let her dye my fair hair and complexion with the decaying shells of the stored up walnuts. I let her blacken my teeth and even voluntarily broke a front tooth the better to affect my disguise. But through it all I had no hope of evading my terrible husband. The third night the funeral was over, the drinking ended, the guests gone, the miller put to bed by his men being too drunk to help himself. They stopped a little while in the kitchen, talking and laughing about the new housekeeper likely to come, and they too went off, shutting but not locking the door. Everything favored us. Amante had tried her ladder on one of the two previous nights and could, by a dexterous throw from beneath, unfasten it from the hook to which it was fixed when it had served its office. She made up a bundle of worthless old clothes in order that we might the better preserve our characters of a traveling peddler and his wife. She stuffed a hump on her back. She thickened my figure. She let her own clothes deep down beneath a heap of others in the chest from which she had taken the man's dress which she wore. And with a few francs in her pocket, we let ourselves down the ladder, unhooked it, and passed into the cold darkness of night again. We had discussed the route which it would be well for us to take while we lay Perdue's in our loft. Amante had told me that her reasoning for inquiring, when we first left Le Rocher, by which way I had first been brought to it, was to avoid the pursuit which she was sure would first be made in the direction of Germany but that now she thought we might return to that district of country where my German fashion of speaking French would excite least observation. I thought that Amante herself had something peculiar in her accent, which I had heard Monsieur de la Tourelle sneer at as Norman Patois, but I said not a word beyond agreeing to her proposal that we should bend our steps towards Germany. Once there, we should, I thought, be safe. Alas! I forgot the unruly time that was overspreading all Europe, overturning all law, and all the protection which law gives. How we wondered, not daring to ask our way. How we lived, how we struggled through many a danger and still more terrors of danger. I shall not tell you now. I will only relate two of our adventures before we reached Frankfurt. The first, although fatal to an innocent lady, was yet, I believe, the cause of my safety. The second I shall tell you, that you may understand why I did not return to my former home, as I had hoped to do when we lay in the miller's loft, and I first became capable of groping after an idea of what my future life might be. I cannot tell you how much in these doubtings and wonderings I became attached to Amante. I have sometimes feared since, lest I cared for her only because she was so necessary to my own safety. But no, it was not so, or not so only or principally. She said once that she was flying for her own life as well as for mine, but we dared not speak much on our danger, or on the horrors that had gone before. We planned a little what was to be our future course, but even for that we did not look forward long. How could we, when every day we scarcely knew if we should see the sun go down? For Amante knew or conjectured far more than I did of the atrocity of the gang to which Monsieur de la Tourelle belonged. And every now and then, just as we seemed to be sinking into the calm of security, we fell upon traces of a pursuit after us in all directions. Once, I remember, we must have been nearly three weeks wearily walking through unfrequented ways, day after day, not daring to make an inquiry as to our whereabouts, nor yet to seem purposeless in our wanderings. We came to a kind of lonely roadside farriers and blacksmiths. I was so tired that Amante declared that, come what might, we would stay there all night, and accordingly she entered the house and boldly announced herself as a traveling tailor, ready to do any odd jobs of work that might be required for a night's lodging and food for herself and wife. She had adopted this plan once or twice before, and with good success, for her father had been a tailor in Rouen, and as a girl she had often helped him with his work, and knew the tailor's slang and habits down to the particular whistle and cry which in France tells so much to those of a trade. At this blacksmith's, as at most other solitary houses far away from a town, there was not only a store of men's clothes laid by as wanting mending when the housewife could afford time, but there was a natural craving after news from a distance, such news as a wandering tailor is bound to furnish. 
The early November afternoon was closing into evening as we sat down, she cross-legged on the great table in the blacksmith's kitchen, drawn close to the window. I closed behind her, sewing at another part of the same garment, and from time to time, well scolded by my seeming husband. All at once, she turned around to speak to me. It was only one word. Courage! I had seen nothing. I sat out of the light, but I turned sick for an instant, and then I braced myself up into a strange strength of endurance to go through I knew not what. The blacksmith's forge was in a shed beside the house, in fronting the road. I heard the hammer stop plying their continual rhythmical beat. She had seen why they ceased. A rider had come up to the forge and dismounted, leading his horse in to be reshod. The broad red light of the forge fire had revealed the face of the rider to Amante, and she apprehended the consequence that really ensued. The rider, after some words with the blacksmith, was ushered in by him into the house place where we sat. Here, good wife, a cup of wine and some galette for this gentleman. Anything, anything, madam, that I can eat and drink in my hand while my horse is being shod. I am in haste and must get on to Forbach tonight. The blacksmith's wife lighted her lamp. Amante had asked her for it five minutes before. How thankful we were that she had not more speedily complied with our request. As it was, we sat in dusk shadow, pretending to stitch away but scarcely able to see. The lamp was placed on the stove, near which my husband, for it was he, stood and warmed himself. By and by he turned around and looked all over the room, taking us in with about the same degree of interest as the inanimate furniture. Amante, cross-legged, fronting him, stooped over her work, whistling softly all the while. He turned again to the stove, impatiently rubbing his hands. He had finished his wine in galette and wanted to be off. I am in haste, my good woman. Ask thy husband to get on more quickly. I will pay him double if he makes haste. The woman went out to do his bidding, and he once more turned round to face us. Amante went on to the second part of the tune. He took it up, whistled a second for an instant or so, and then the blacksmith's wife re-entering, he moved towards her as if to receive her answer the more speedily. One moment, monsieur, only one moment. There was a nail out of the off fore shoe which my husband is replacing. It will delay monsieur again if that shoe also came off. Madame is right, said he, but my haste is urgent. If madame knew my reason, she would pardon my impatience. Once a happy husband, now a deserted and betrayed man, I pursue a wife on whom I lavished all my love, but who has abused my confidence and fled from my house, doubtless to some paramour, carrying off with her all the jewels and money on which she could lay her hands. It is possible Madame may have heard or seen something of her. She was accompanied in her flight by a base, profligate woman from Paris, whom I, unhappy man, had myself engaged for my wife's waiting maid, little dreaming what corruption I was bringing into my house. Oh, is it possible, said the good woman, throwing up her hands. Amante went on whistling a little lower, out of respect to the conversation. However, I am tracing the wicked fugitives. I am on their track. And the handsome, effeminate face looked as ferocious as any demon's. They will not escape me, but every minute is a minute of misery to me till I meet my wife. Madam has sympathy, has she not? He drew his face into a hard, unnatural smile, and then both went out to the forge as if once more to hasten the blacksmith over his work. Amante stopped her whistling for one instant. Go on as you are, without change of an eyelid even. In a few minutes he will be gone, and it will be over. It was a necessary caution, for I was on the point of giving way, and throwing myself weakly upon her neck, we went on, she whistling and stitching, I making semblance to sew. And it was well we did so, for almost directly he came back for his whip, which he had laid down and forgotten. And again I felt one of those sharp, quick scanning glances sent all around the room, and taking in all. Then we heard him right away, and then, it had been long too dark to see well, I dropped my work and gave way to my trembling and shuddering. The blacksmith's wife returned. She was a good creature. Amante told her that I was cold and weary, and she insisted on my stopping my work and going to sit near the stove. 
hastening at the same time her preparations for supper, which, in honor of us and of Monsieur's liberal payment, was to be a little less frugal than ordinary. It was well for me that she made me taste a little of the cider soup she was preparing, or I could not have held up. In spite of Amante's warning look, and the remembrance of her frequent exhortations to act resolutely up to the characters we had assumed, whatever befell. To cover my agitation, Amante stopped her whistling, and began to talk, and by the time the blacksmith came in, she and the good woman of the house were in full flow. He began at once upon the handsome gentleman, who had paid him so well, all his sympathy was with him, and both he and his wife only wished he might overtake his wicked wife and punish her as she deserved. And then the conversation took a turn, not uncommon to those whose lives are quiet and monotonous. Everyone seemed to vie with each other in telling about some horror, and the savage and mysterious band of robbers called the chauffeurs, who infested all the roads leading to the Rhine, with Schinderhounds at their head, furnished many a tale which made the very marrow of my bones run cold, and quenched even Amante's power of talking. Her eyes grew large and wild, her cheeks blanched, and for once she sought by her looks help from me. The new call upon me roused me. I rose and said, with their permission, my husband and I would seek our bed, for that we had traveled far and were early risers. I added that we would get up betimes and finish our piece of work. The blacksmith said we should be early birds if we rose before him, and the good wife seconded my proposal with kindly bustle. One other such story as those they had been relating, and I do believe Amante would have fainted. As it was, a night's rest set her up. We arose and finished our work betimes and shared the plentiful breakfast of the family. Then we had to set forth again, only knowing that to Forbach we must not go, yet believing, as was indeed the case, that Forbach lay between us and that Germany to which we were directing our course. Two days more we wandered on, making a round, I suspect, and returning upon the road to Forbach, a league or two nearer to that town than the blacksmith's house. But as we never made inquiries, I hardly knew where we were, when we came one night to a small town, with a good, large, rambling inn in the very center of the principal street. We had begun to feel as if there were more safety in towns than in the loneliness of the country. As we had parted with a ring of mine not many days before to a traveling jeweler, he was too glad to purchase it far below its real value to make many inquiries as to how it came into the possession of a poor working tailor, such as Amante seemed to be. We resolved to stay at this inn all night, and gather such particulars and information as we could by which to direct our onward course. We took our supper in the darkest corner of the Salle à Manger, having previously bargained for a small bedroom across the court and over the stables. We needed food sorely, but we hurried on our meal from dread of anyone entering that public room who might recognize us. Just in the middle of our meal, the public diligence drove, lumbering up under the Porta Corchere, and disgorged its passengers. Most of them turned into the room where we sat, cowering and fearful, for the door was opposite to the porter's lodge, and both opened on to the wide covered entrance from the street. Among the passengers came in a young, fair-haired lady, attended by an elderly French maid. The poor young creature tossed her head and shrank away from the common room, full of evil smells and promiscuous company, and demanded, in German French, to be taken to some private apartment. We heard that she and her maid had come in the coop, and probably from pride, poor young lady. She had avoided all association with her fellow passengers, thereby exciting their dislike and ridicule. All these little pieces of hearsay had a significance to us afterwards, though, at the time, the only remark made that bore upon the future was Amante's whisper to me that the young lady's hair was exactly the color of mine, which she had cut off and burnt in the stove in the miller's kitchen, in one of her descents from our hiding place in the loft. As soon as we could, we struck round in the shadow, leaving the boisterous and merry fellow passengers to their supper. We crossed the court, borrowed a lantern from the ostler, and scrambled up the rude steps to our chamber above the stable. There was no door into it. The entrance was the hole into which the ladder fitted. The window looked into the court. We were tired and soon fell asleep. I was wakened by a noise in the stable below. One instant of listening and I awakened Amante, 
placing my hand on her mouth to prevent any exclamation in her half-roused state. We heard my husband speaking about his horse to the ostler. It was his voice, I am sure of it. Amante said so too. We durst not move to rise and satisfy ourselves. For five minutes or so, he went on giving directions. Then he left the stable, and softly stealing to our window, we saw him cross the court and re-enter the inn. We consulted as to what we should do. We feared to excite remark or suspicion by descending and leaving our chamber, or else immediate escape was our strongest idea. Then the ostler left the stable, locking the door on the outside. We must try and drop through the window, if indeed it is well to go at all, said Amante. With reflection came wisdom. We should excite suspicion by leaving without paying our bill. We were on foot and might easily be pursued. So we sat on our bed's edge, talking and shivering, while from across the court the laughter rang merrily, and the company slowly dispersed one by one, their lights fitting, their lights flitting past the windows as they went upstairs and settled each one to his rest. We crept into our bed, holding each other tight and listening to every sound as if we thought we were tracked and might meet our death at any moment. In the dead of night, just at the profound stillness preceding the turn into another day, we heard a soft, cautious step crossing the yard. The key into the table was turned. Someone came into the stable. We felt rather than heard him there. A horse started a little and made a restless movement with his feet, then whinnied recognition. He who had entered made two or three low sounds to the animal and then led him into the court. Amante sprang to the window with the noiseless activity of a cat. She looked out, but dared not speak a word. We heard the great door into the street open, a pause for mounting, and the horse's footsteps were lost in distance. Then Amante came back to me. It was he. He is gone, she said, and once more we lay down, trembling and shaking. This time we fell sound asleep. We slept long and late. We were wakened by many hurrying feet and many confused voices. All the world seemed awake and astir. We rose and dressed ourselves, and coming down we looked around among the crowd collected in the courtyard in order to assure ourselves he was not there before we left the shelter of the stable. The instant we were seen, two or three people rushed to us. Have you heard? Do you know? That poor young lady. Oh, come and see. And so we were hurried, almost in spite of ourselves, across the court and up the great open stairs of the main building of the inn into a bedchamber where lay the beautiful young German lady, so full of graceful pride the night before, now white and still in death. By her stood the French maid, crying and gesticulating. Oh, madam, if you had but suffered me to stay with you. Oh, the baron, what will he say? And so she went on. Her state had but just been discovered. It had been supposed that she was fatigued and was sleeping late until a few minutes before. The surgeon of the town had been sent for, and the landlord of the inn was trying vainly to enforce order until he came, and from time to time drinking little cups of brandy and offering them to the guests, who were all assembled there, pretty much as the servants were doing in the courtyard. At last the surgeon came, all fell back and hung on the words that were to fall from his lips. See, said the landlord, this lady came last night by the diligence with her maid, doubtless a great lady, for she must have a private sitting room. She was Madame the Baroness de Roder, said the French maid, and was difficult to please in the matter of supper and a sleeping room. She went to bed well, though fatigued. Her maid left her. I begged to be allowed to sleep in her room as we were in a strange inn, of the character of which we knew nothing, but she would not let me. My mistress was such a great lady. And slept with my servants, continued the landlord. The morning we thought Madame was still slumbering, but when eight, nine, ten, and near eleven o'clock came, I bade her maid use my passkey and enter her room. The door was not locked, only closed, and here she was found dead, is she not, Monsieur? With her face down on her pillow and her beautiful hair all scattered wild, she would never let me tie it up saying it made her head ache. Such hair, said the waiting maid, lifting up a long golden tress and letting it fall again. I remembered Amante's words the night before and crept close up to her. Meanwhile, the doctor was examining the body underneath the bedclothes. 
which the landlord until now had not allowed to be disarranged. The surgeon drew out his hand, all bathed and stained with blood, and holding up a short, sharp knife with a piece of paper fastened round it. Here has been foul play, he said. The deceased lady has been murdered. This dagger was aimed straight at her heart. Then putting on his spectacles, he read the writing on the bloody paper, dimmed and horribly obscured as it was. Numero un, ainsi le chauffeurs se vengent. Let us go, said I to Amante. Oh, let us leave this horrible place. Wait a little, she said. Only a few minutes more. It will be better. Immediately the voices of all proclaimed their suspicions of the cavalier who had arrived the night before. He had, they said, made so many inquiries about the young lady, whose supercilious conduct, all in the sala et manger, had been discussing on his entrance. They were talking about her as we left the room. We must have come in directly afterwards and not until he had learnt all about her. Had he spoken of the business which necessitated his departure at dawn of day, and made his arrangements with both landlord and ostler for the possession of the keys of the stable and porch cochere? In short, there was no doubt as to the murderer. Even before the arrival of the legal functionary who had been sent for by the surgeon. But the word on the paper chilled everyone with terror. Les chauffeurs. Who were they? No one knew. Some of the gang might even then be in the room overhearing and noting down fresh objects for vengeance. In Germany, I had heard little of this terrible gang, and I had paid no greater heed to the stories related once or twice about them in Karlsruhe than one does to tales about ogres. But here, in their very haunts, I learnt the full amount of the terror they inspired. No one would be legally responsible for any evidence criminating the murderer. The public prosecutor shrank from the duties of his office. What do I say? Neither Amante nor I, knowing far more of the actual guilt of the man who had killed that poor sleeping young lady, durst breathe a word. We appeared to be wholly ignorant of everything. We who might have told so much. But how could we? We were broken down with terrific anxiety and fatigue, with the knowledge that we, above all, were doomed victims, and that the blood, heavily dripping from the bedclothes onto the floor, was dripping thus out of the poor dead body, because, when living, she had been mistaken for me. At length, Amante went up to the landlord and asked permission to leave his inn, doing all openly and humbly so as to excite neither ill will nor suspicion. Indeed, suspicion was otherwise directed, and he willingly gave us leave to depart. A few days afterwards we were across the Rhine, in Germany, making our way towards Frankfurt, but still keeping our disguises, and Amante still working at her trade. On the way we met a young man, a wandering journeyman from Heidelberg. I knew him, although I did not choose that he should know me. I asked him, as carelessly as I could, how the old miller was now. He told me he was dead. This realization of the worst apprehensions caused by his long silence shocked me inexpressibly. It seemed as though every prop gave way under me. I had been talking to Amante only that very day of the safety and comfort of the home that awaited her in my father's house, of the gratitude which the old man would feel towards her, and how there, in that peaceful dwelling far from the terrible land of France, she should find ease and security for all the rest of her life. All this I thought I had to promise, and even yet more had I looked for, for myself. I looked to the unburdening of my heart and conscience by telling all I knew to my best and wisest friend. I looked to his love as a sure guidance as well as a comforting stay, and behold, he was gone away from me forever. I had left the room hastily on hearing of the sad news from the Heidelberger. Presently, Amante followed. Poor madame, she said, consoling me to the best of her abilities, and then she told me by degrees what more she had learned respecting my home, about which she knew almost as much as I did, from my frequent talks on the subject, both at Les Rochers and on the dreary, doleful road we had come along. She had continued the conversation after I left, by asking about my brother and his wife. Of course they lived on at the mill, but the man said, with what truth I know not, but I believed it firmly all the time, that Babette had completely got the upper hand of my brother, who only saw through her eyes and heard with her ears. 
that there had been much Heidelberg gossip of late days about her sudden intimacy with a grand French gentleman who had appeared at the mill, a relation by marriage, married, in fact, to the miller's sister, who, by all accounts, had behaved abominably and ungratefully. But that was no reason for Bobette's extreme and sudden intimacy with him, going about everywhere with the French gentleman, and since he left, as the Heidelberger said he knew for a fact, corresponding with him constantly. Yet her husband saw no harm in it all, seemingly, though to be sure he was so out of spirits, what with his father's death and the news of his sister's infamy, that he hardly knew how to hold up his head. Now, said Amante, all this proves that Monsieur de la Tourelle has suspected that you would go back to the nest in which you were reared, and that he has been there and found that you have not yet returned, but probably he still imagines that you will do so, and has accordingly engaged your sister-in-law as a kind of informant. Madame has said that her sister-in-law bore no extreme good will, and the defamatory story he has got the start of us in spreading will not tend to increase the favor in which your sister-in-law holds you. No doubt the assassin was retracing his steps when we met him near Forbach, and having heard of the poor German lady with her French maid and her pretty blonde complexion, he followed her. If Madame will still be guided by me, and my child, I beg of you still to trust me, said Amante, breaking out of her respectful formality into the way of talking more naturally to those who had shared and escaped from common dangers. More natural, too, where the speaker was conscious of a power of protection which the other did not possess. We will go on to Frankfurt and lose ourselves, for a time at least, in the numbers of people who throng a great town. And you have told me that Frankfurt is a great town. We will be husband and wife, we will take a small lodging, and you shall housekeep and live indoors. I, as the rougher and the more alert, will continue my father's trade and seek work at the tailor's shops. I could think of no better plan, so we followed this out. In a back street of Frankfurt, we found two furnished rooms to let on a sixth story. The one we entered had no light from day. A dingy lamp swung perpetually from the ceiling, and from that, or from the open door leading into the bedroom beyond, came our only light. The bedroom was more cheerful, but very small. Such as it was, it almost exceeded our possible means. The money from the sale of my ring was almost exhausted, and Amante was a stranger in the place, speaking only French, moreover, and the good Germans were hating the French people right heartily. However, we succeeded better than our hopes, and even laid by a little against the time of my confinement. I never stirred abroad, and saw no one, and Amante's want of knowledge of German kept her in a state of comparative isolation. At length my child was born, my poor, worse-than-fatherless child. It was a girl, as I had prayed for. I had feared lest a boy might have something of the tiger nature of its father, but a girl seemed all my own. And yet not all my own, for the faithful Amante's delight and glory in the babe almost exceeded mine, an outward show it certainly did. We had not been able to afford any attendance beyond what a neighboring sage femme could give us, and she came frequently, bringing in with her a little store of gossip and wonderful tales culled out of her own experience every time. One day she began to tell me about a great lady in whose service her daughter had lived as scullion or some such thing. Such a beautiful lady with a handsome husband, but grief comes to the palace as well as to the garret and why or wherefore no one knew, but somehow the Baron de Roder must have incurred the vengeance from the terrible chauffeurs. For not many months ago, as Madame was going to see her relations in Alsace, she was stabbed dead as she lay in bed at some hotel on the road. Had I not seen it in the Gazette? Had I not heard? Why, she had been told that as far off as Lyons there were placards offering a heavy reward on the part of the Baron de Roder for information respecting the murderer of his wife. But no one could help him, for all who could bear evidence were in such terror of the chauffeurs. They were hundreds of them, she had been told, rich and poor, great gentlemen and peasants, all leagued together by most frightful oaths to hunt to the death anyone who bore witness against them, so that even they who survived the tortures to which the chauffeurs subjected many of the people whom they plundered dared not to recognize them again, would not dare, even did they see them at the bar of a court of justice. For if one were condemned, were there not hundreds sworn to avenge his death? I told all this to Amante, 
and we began to fear that if Monsieur de la Tourelle or Lefebvre or any of the gang at Les Rochers had seen these placards, they would know that the poor lady stabbed by the former was the Baroness de Roder, and that they would set forth again in search of me. This fresh apprehension told on my health and impeded my recovery. We had so little money we could not call in a physician, at least not one in established practice. But Amante found out a young doctor for whom, indeed, she had sometimes worked, and offering to pay him in kind, she brought him to see me, her sick wife. He was very gentle and thoughtful, though, like ourselves, very poor. But he gave much time and consideration to the case, saying once to Amante that he saw my constitution had experienced some severe shock, from which it was probable that my nerves would never entirely recover. By and by I shall name this doctor, and then you will know, better than I can describe, his character. I grew strong in time. Stronger, at least. I was able to work a little at home and to sun myself and my baby at the garret window in the roof. It was all the air I dared to take. I constantly wore the disguise I had first set out with, as constantly had I renewed the disfiguring dye which changed my hair and complexion. But the perpetual state of terror in which I had been during the whole months succeeding my escape from Les Rochers made me loathe the idea of ever again walking in the open daylight, exposed to the sight and recognition of every passer-by. In vain Amante reasoned, in vain the doctor urged, docile in every other thing, in this I was obstinate. I would not stir out. One day Amante returned from her work, full of news, some of it good, some such as to cause us apprehension. The good news was this. The master for whom she worked as journeyman was going to send her with some others to a great house at the other side of Frankfurt, where there would be private theatricals and where many new dresses and much alteration of old ones would be required. The tailors employed were all to stay at this house until the day of representation was over, as it was at some distance from the town and no one could tell when their work would be ended, but the pay was to be proportionately good. The other thing she had to say was this. She had that day met the traveling jeweler to whom she and I had sold my ring. It was rather a peculiar one, given to me by my husband. We had felt at the time that it might be the means of tracing us, but we were penniless and starving, and what else could we do? She had seen that this Frenchman had recognized her at the same instant that she did him, and she thought at the same time, that there was a gleam of more than common intelligence on his face as he did so. This idea had been confirmed by his following her some way on the other side of the street, but she had invaded him with her better knowledge of the town, and the increasing darkness of the night. Still, it was well that she was going to such a distance from our dwelling on the next day, and she had brought me in a stock of provisions, begging me to keep within doors, with a strange kind of fearful oblivion, of the fact that I had never set foot beyond the threshold of the house since I had first entered it, scarce ever ventured down the stairs. But although my poor, my dear, very faithful Amante was like one possessed that last night, she spoke continually of the dead, which is a bad sign for the living. She kissed you. Yes, it was you, my daughter, my darling, whom I bore beneath my bosom away from the fearful castle of your father. I call him so for the first time. I must call him so once again before I have done. Amante kissed you, sweet baby, blessed little comforter, as if she never could leave off. And then she went away, alive. Two days, three days passed away. That third evening I was sitting within my bolted doors, you asleep on your pillow by my side, when a step came up the stair and I knew it must be for me, for ours were the topmost rooms. Someone knocked. I held my very breath, but someone spoke and I knew it was the good Dr. Voss. Then I crept to the door and answered. Are you alone? asked I. Yes, said he in a still lower voice. Let me in. I let him in, and he was as alert as I in bolting and barring the door. Then he came and whispered to me his doleful tale. He had come from the hospital in the opposite quarter of the town. The hospital which he visited, he should have been with me sooner but he had feared lest he should be watched. He had come from Amante's deathbed. Her fears of the jeweler were too well founded. She had left the house where she was employed that morning to transact some errand connected with her work in town, 
She must have been followed and dogged on her way back through solitary wood paths, for some of the wood rangers belonging to the great house had found her lying there, stabbed to death, but not dead, with the poniard again plunged through the fatal writing once more, but this time with the word un underlined, so as to show that the assassin was aware of his previous mistake. Numero un, ainsi les chauffeurs se vengent. They had carried her to the house and given her restoratives till she had recovered the feeble use of her speech. But, oh, faithful dear friend and sister, even then she remembered me and refused to tell what no one else among her fellow workmen knew, where she lived or with whom. Life was ebbing away fast, and they had no resource but to carry her to the nearest hospital, where, of course, the fact of her sex was made known. Fortunately, both for her and for me, the doctor in attendance was the very Dr. Voss whom we already knew. To him, while awaiting her confessor, she told enough to enable him to understand the position in which I was left. Before the priest had heard half of her tale, Amante was dead. Dr. Voss told me he had made all sorts of detours and waited thus late at night for fear of being watched and followed, but I do not think he was. At any rate, as I afterwards learnt from him, the Baron Roder, on hearing of the similitude of this murder with that of his wife in every particular, made such a search after the assassins that, although they were not discovered, they were compelled to take to flight for the time. I can hardly tell you now by what arguments Dr. Voss, at first merely my benefactor, sparing me a portion of his small modicum, at length persuaded me to become his wife. His wife, he called it, I called it, for we went through the religious ceremony too much slighted at the time, and as we were both Lutherans, and Monsieur de la Tourelle had pretended to be of the reformed religion, a divorce from the latter would have been easily procurable by German law, both ecclesiastical and legal, could we have summoned so fearful a man into any court. The good doctor took me and my child by stealth to his modest dwelling, and there I lived in the same deep retirement, never seeing the full light of day. Although when the dye had once passed away from my face, my husband did not wish me to renew it. There was no need. My yellow hair was gray. My complexion was ashen-colored. No creature could have recognized the fresh-colored, bright-haired young woman of eighteen months before. The few people whom I saw knew me only as Madame Voss, a widow much older than himself, whom Dr. Voss had secretly married. They called me the Grey Woman. He made me give you his surname. Till now you have known no other father. While he lived, you needed no father's love. Only once more did the old terror come upon me. For some reason which I forgot, I broke through my usual custom and went to the window of my room for some purpose, either to shut or to open it. Looking out into the street for an instant, I was fascinated by the sight of Monsieur de la Tourelle, gay, young, elegant as ever, walking along on the opposite side of the street. The noise I had made with the window caused him to look up. He saw me, an old gray woman, and he did not recognize me. Yet it was not three years since we had parted, and his eyes were keen and dreadful like those of the lynx. I told Monsieur Voss on his return home, and he tried to cheer me, but the shock of seeing Monsieur de la Tourelle had been too terrible for me. I was ill for long months afterwards. Once again I saw him, dead. He and Lefebvre were at last caught, hunted down by the Baron de Roder and some of their crimes. Dr. Voss had heard of their arrest, their condemnation, their death. But he never said a word to me, until one day he bade me show him that I loved him by my obedience and my trust. He took me on a long carriage journey, where to I know not, for we never spoke of that day again. I was led through a prison into a closed courtyard where, decently draped in the last robes of death, concealing the marks of decapitation, lay Monsieur de la Tourelle and two or three others, whom I had known as at Le Rocher. After that conviction, Dr. Voss tried to persuade me to return to a more natural mode of life and to go out more. But although I sometimes complied with his wish, yet the old terror was ever strong upon me, and he, seeing what an effort it was, gave up urging me at last. You know all the rest, how we both mourned bitterly the loss of that dear husband and father, for such I will ever call him, and as such you must consider him my child after this one revelation is over. 
Why has it been made, you ask? For this reason, my child. The lover, whom you have only known as Monsieur Lebrun, a French artist, told me but yesterday his real name, dropped because the bloodthirsty Republicans might consider it as too aristocratic. It is Maurice de Poissy. And that was The Grey Woman by Elizabeth Gaskell. And now we know the secret of The Grey Woman and why she was so opposed to her daughter Ursula marrying this man. It's not because she didn't love her daughter. It's not because of you know any of those reasons, but it's because the man that her daughter was going to marry is the son of the man who was murdered by Anna's husband. <laughs> okay, can you track that? Uh, it is, it's really like a soap opera, but uh, only, you know, interesting and good. Sorry if you like soap operas, they're not my cup of tea. Boy, this is, this is such a good story. The the fear, the hiding, you, you know, the, the trauma this poor woman went through is so well written and so, I think, so accurate. You know, I feel sorry for people who have been in situations like this. It is traumatic. It affects them. You you see how she became afraid to go outside. She was afraid of people. She's just lives her life constantly in fear because of this evil man and the people he hangs out with, uh, so much so that it affects her physical appearance. She, her Skin color fades to gray. Her cut, her hair turns to gray. She looks older beyond her years, so that at the end of the story, when her husband you know makes eye contact with her from the crowded crowded street, he doesn't even recognize her. But glad to say, he got his comeuppance in the end. So much, fa- so many fascinating things about this story. How like Amante just pretty much takes charge and and saves her, saves Anna, and disguises herself as a man they they live like a married couple uh in hiding i want to read more to find out what how people of that time period would have received that story because i I think that probably would have shocked the bonnets off a few of them (laughs) i I love it how these two women looked out for each other well amante more than anna was able to but she just did the right thing and, and helped her in the end anna was able to be married to a from the sounds of it a nice guy and all that or or at least they lived as if they were married. Really, really interesting story. All right. Well, I'm excited now to talk with Dr. Diane Duffy. We're we're going to go ahead and play that interview and uh, keep the episode going. It's like I said, it's going to be a long episode today, uh, but I think you'll really enjoy what Dr. Duffy has to bring to our discussion about um, Elizabeth Gaskell, her stories, and the things that pertain to her. So I'm going to go ahead and play that now and enjoy the interview. Today on the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast, I have a special guest with us. Uh, Her name is Diane Duffy. She uh, has worked with the Gaskell Society as well as been a volunteer and researcher at the Elizabeth Gaskell House Museum. She has a PhD in women's writing and focused on the Romantic Period. I really am grateful that she is willing to be on the podcast today so I can pick her brain about Elizabeth Gaskell. Dr. Duffy, welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Thank you. It's great to have you on. And uh, through the miracle of Zoom, we're able to place this transatlantic phone call here, as it were. <laughs> well, that's lovely to speak to everybody over in in the USA. Um, we do have quite a few members of the Gaskell Society from the USA. Yeah. I was actually first introduced to Elizabeth Gaskell through an, a, another podcast that was talking about uh, a lot of the Victorian era writers. And, and I, I think I recognized her name, but I didn't actually start reading it or reading her until a couple of years ago. Uh, hearing these uh, ladies on a podcast talking about her. And I thought, well, that sounds great. Go ahead and give us a little bit about yourself and your work with the Gaskell Society and in the house as well. Okay. 
I started working at the Elizabeth Gaskell House in 2014, just after it opened. We don't like to call it a museum. Uh, it's a literary house for us because mm. we don't have a lot of objects uh, that are in glass cases. The one thing we pride ourselves on is that visitors can come and, you know, touch and pick books up and sit down on the chairs and, you know, generally make themselves feel at home. Um, obviously, I'm a literature uh, student and had been for many years, and I used to teach Elizabeth Gaskell's work for GCSE, Mary Barton in particular, uh, read Wives and Daughters when I was quite young, and uh, North and South. So I wasn't new to Elizabeth Gaskell, and obviously once I'd finished school, once I'd finished teaching in school, I needed something to fill up my time that was literary and intellectual, uh, rather than sitting at home, um, you know, doing not much. So I took up the house, which I love. I absolutely love. The people are fabulous. It's just like a big extended family. The research is great because hardly anybody else does any. So I tend to be the one that produces the, uh, the work on, on that. And the Gaskell Society very much came afterwards. Um, I was persuaded to join. I took over from a lady called Elizabeth Williams, who was also a trustee at the house um, because she was ill. So I took over running the discussion groups. We do one a month during the winter, apart from December, because it's Christmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, we study a particular text or a collection of short stories and have a, a discussion every month at the end of the month. Now, as we're now on Zoom, and because of COVID, and we've been doing these, these talks on discussion groups on Zoom, um, we are still carrying on doing that and opening it up to anybody who wants to join outside Manchester. Because we've got a, a society in London, we've got one in Bath, we've got one in the south, uh, in the southwest, we've got a, one in Italy, one uh, Spanish people join from the universities in Spain, we've got members in the USA, and we've got members in Australia and a big society in Japan. So it's quite international, um, which is good that we can get international audiences um, Thank you, Zoom. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's really opened up. It's really opened up this intellectual debate. I think I was on Zoom yesterday doing a conference uh, on Mary Shelley, um, and they were from all over. I mean, really, all over mm -hmm. the world. It was just fabulous. You know, it's never been able to happen before. I was on. Uh, I think it was the Society's webpage this morning, uh, or it might have been the the House, but. Uh, I saw they they had a monthly book club. Yeah, that's what I run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just signed up. There was the one in I think in October that is going on, uh, talking about uh, great expectations. So, oh no, that's the house then. Oh, that's the that's house. Not okay. Ours. Yeah, I'm doing Ruth in October. Yeah, at the uh, Gaskell Society. Yes, this okay. is uh, that that isn't me. That's uh, Sherry Ashworth runs that. Uh, she okay. she was a lecturer at uh, MMU Manchester Metropolitan University. Okay, so uh, uh, I might check out the other one too because I, I love. Well, and, and for for the for the house, you know, it was I don't know what it comes out to in American dollars, but it was three pounds, I guess. Uh, mm. And and I can you know, and there will be a Zoom meeting with that, and and I just love that we're able to connect with yeah. with people across across the world, like. And like it, it's and, such and, a wonderful way to share ideas. I think mm -hmm. this is the thing. It just gives you so much scope. It's unbelievable. And this is why we we at the Gaskell Society and, and at the Elizabeth Gaskell House, Elizabeth Gaskell's House are very loath to give it up because it's just got so many people mm -hmm. interested. I'm doing Lois the Witch for Halloween at, at Elizabeth Gaskell's house, which is on Zoom. I'm also doing Mary Wilson Craft and Mrs. Gaskell, Elizabeth Gaskell and Mary Wilson Craft in November. Um, a friend of mine, Anthony, is doing one on um, on Christmas for 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 Christmas. Uh, so we we've got quite a lot, you know, going on. And then we have cross street talks for the Elizabeth Gaskell Society, uh, which we're also going to carry on hmm. doing on on Zoom. So there's plenty going on. I think. I, I was going to ask how things have been going for the society and the in the house this past year and a half with. Uh, the pandemic shutting down so many things. Uh, how, how have you guys fared with that? It looks like you've done a lot online. 
well uh, the house uh, at the house we've not been able, we run weddings at the house which clearly we've not been able to do because of the pandemic so mm -hmm. we have had funding to tr sort of tide us over because obviously we can't have visitors in either but we opened again we've opened for book sales um, when shops could open so we opened once a month for book sales which did quite well and we opened again in um was it Ju July, wasn't it, when we opened, when we could open again from the pandemic? So we've been opening three days a week, which is what we do. Mm -hmm. We still wear masks, obviously, but you know yeah. we're still open. People can are now allowed to touch things, which is good. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the society we've just carried on. People miss the people. They miss the interaction with real people. But we've found that the Zoom meetings have been really successful. So. We've actually kept going and had lots going on. And it's been, you know, it's been it's been a revelation, really. And it's something, as I said, I've said before, we wouldn't want to give up. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, it's it's a worldwide connection now. And, and mm -hmm. it doesn't always seem like there's good things that come during the, those bad times. But this is one that uh, I, I've, I've made friends now <laughs> through through podcasting. I mean, I've got people I would call a friend who live in, you know, New Zealand or yeah. uh, wherever. And I've never met them probably won't yeah. unless I can fly down there. But, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's good. Yeah. yeah, it is amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so what are some things that we can do to help uh, support the museum or, or help uh, support even the society? Like we've talked about a little bit, there's some online programs available. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, as a, a far distant country I mean it's not just easy to, yeah. <laughs> to visit but we do. <laughs> so that that's quite difficult I suppose we do do online tours though so we've now got one running every month so if people want to have a look around the house um, and have some of the artifacts and the life and times of Elizabeth Gaskell explained um, they're a good way to do that remotely so if you're interested that would be a, a you know a good thing to join um I, I just think supporting the online programs and you know helping in that way is a good way that uh, that you can support something that is quite yeah. remote for you guys and and for people in australia and other sort of countries yeah Far uh, uh, <laughs> so they do online tours every month uh, yeah. of the house okay mm -hmm. and, and that information's on the uh, house it website, is on the I'm house sure. website yeah okay. what's on on the what, what's on section yeah there's quite a lot on the what's on section um so if, if you want to hook up we also do blogs regularly we've got a blog post on the on the house and the gaskell society mm -hmm. um that the volunteers have written and various volunteers have written um i've done most of them on the gaskell society not all anthony does a colleague of mine does some of them but uh, we, I mean, they're, they're quite interesting to read about Mrs. Gaskell's life and works. So that's a, another way in which you can find out what's going on a little bit about Manchester and the, uh, you know, the environs in the uh, in the 19th century. But Mrs. Gaskell was very well traveled. Yeah, she had a friend in the US, uh, Charles Elliot Norton. You might have heard of him. He was an art critic from uh, from the East Coast. And she wrote to him and her daughters wrote to him for many, many years. Um, she traveled to Paris, she traveled to Italy regularly, Rome, Florence, Venice. Uh, she traveled to Germany, she traveled to Switzerland. So she wasn't a stay at home person at all. Uh, Heidelberg, she brought a servant back from Heidelberg in 1858. And she mm -hmm. had a very, they were Unitarians and and they were very inclusive people. So they were, they had good friends who were from all sorts of races, religions, you know, um, people that might have been pariahs to the Anglicans were inclusive, included by the Unitarians. And um, when she was a friend of Charlotte Bronte's, as you know, and Charlotte Bronte visited uh, Plymouth Grove, the house, on three occasions. And when she married, Arthur Bell Nichols, who was extremely bigoted Anglican, I think, high church, and um, he wouldn't allow her to communicate with the Gaskells in any way, shape or form. 
and Mrs Gaskell says in her letters, I'm afraid he will not let her be intimate with us heretics. <laughs> and that's how she describes herself as a dissenter in the 1850s. Oh, that's uh, that's funny. I, I have really appreciated her wit as I've read some of her books. It, it's uh, in some of her writing. It, uh, she, uh, you know, she wasn't afraid to, to speak her mind sometimes, it seems like, or to, to point out uh, problems or flaws that, that she wants to address. Yes, yeah, she has a, a very witty letter to John Forster, the, um, well, he was Dickens' uh, executor, and uh, he was a first reader for Chapman and Hall, the publishers. It was John Forster that put M Mary Barton in print in 1848. And um, she, said, she writes this letter to him about John, Ru John Ruskin's wife, Effie Ruskin, Effie Gray, as was. And she said, oh, she's a charming woman. But she'd be more charming. She had smallpox. And then there's a little bit. And then she said, if you don't burn this letter, I will never speak to you again. <laughs> <laughs> and she thought Effie Gray was very vain. So if she'd had smallpox, she would have had to have taken down that vanity and she would have been a nicer person in Mrs. Gaskell's view. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, let's change gears a little bit here and talk about uh, Mrs. Gaskell herself. This is kind of a broad question and, and people have written books about it, I suppose. But uh, if somebody comes up to you and says, who is Elizabeth Gaskell? Uh, how, how would you answer that? How long have you got? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Yes. Um, I, well, first and foremost, people know her as a writer, I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, and the first thing I would talk about is Manchester, Mrs. Gaskell's Manchester and her philanthropic work with the poor in Manchester, which was really great and which is pretty much documented in Mary Barton and North and South. So I would say she was the wife of a Unitarian minister. She was a writer and she was a champion of the underclasses in in Manchester and I'm sure that is, is how she would like to be remembered although she hated any biography she re she told her daughters not to let anybody write the biography mm. uh, they burnt mm. a lot of her letters I think she was very worried after the biography of Charlotte Bronte had gone so badly wrong for her she had two lawsuits against her and um, hopped off to Rome out of the way <laughs> and let her husband, her husband and her friend's husband, who was a lawyer, deal with it for her and then complained that she didn't know anything about it. You know, this is how she was. Um, but I think she is well remembered. She is very, very well remembered um, in Manchester as this, this woman who worked to help people. So in, in that regard, uh, she, she was a bit like Dickens in that sense. Uh, I, I, I think, and I, I'm, I really enjoy Charles Dickens's work. He's one, he's probably my favorite writer, but I've, I've been saying lately that Elizabeth Gaskell is, is getting really close to number two, if not number one. I mean, well, well, I don't think Dickens would have thought she was like him and I'm right. not sure she would have liked to have <laughs> people to think she was like Dickens. You know what he said of her, don't you? You know, they used to, they used to have some terrible um, confrontations in writing mm -hmm. about, the fact that she was never on time with her serializations and, uh, you know, she didn't do as he told her. She wanted, she got, she thought she'd not got her own way. He thought she'd had got her own way. And he says to his sub-editor, Henry Willis, oh, Mrs. Gaskell, oh, fearful, fearful. If I were Mr. G, how I would beat her. <laughs> I had to laugh over the story when she wrote uh, the old nurse's story and Dickens wanted her to change the ending. Oh yeah, if, if I remember right, and, and she yeah. didn't want to or something, but then she did change it. But she changed it differently from what Dickens said to change it to. I, I don't know. I just find that amusing that this this lady, you know, Dickens was a fairly popular writer at the time. I I, I think um, Gaskell was as well. But you've got like these these two strong personalities just mm -hmm. butting heads, and to me, it, it seems like. Uh, women didn't always have a voice back in the 1800s and she she had one and she wasn't afraid to use it and even oh, no, tell, not at all even no. tell someone like Dickens hey be quiet I know what I'm doing <laughs> you know she he she sent him a manuscript this is north and south this was the one that they had the most issues over mm -hmm. I think and and Dickens loved to 
uh, ride roughshod over his writers. He very often rewrote things that they'd done, you know, and and published it. Mm -hmm. So she sent him a manuscript and he sent it back very much changed. Mm. And she sent the original one back to him. (laughs) (laughs) It's almost like print and be damned, you know? (laughs) Yes, yes. I liked it this way. Thank you very much. (laughs) Yes, leave it alone. And he did. He he published what she told him. Um, He did. He called her Scheherazade, and um, I think the public liked her, really, and I think he was worried about upsetting her, so he didn't like to upset her too much. And after he'd, um, after he'd said that about, about her, I think he wrote this very flattering, uh, you know, letter to, to, to my dear Scheherazade, you know, to try and get her back on side, because he was worried that she'd just not write anymore for him, and he couldn't afford not to have her on, on the team, so to speak. From what I know of Dickens, he, it was good for him to have some humility check there. So, <laughs> Absolutely. I quite agree with you. <laughs> uh, his, his ego can take it. <laughs> you had mentioned something which I find always heartbreaking, that they had burned a lot of her letters. Mm. You know, as, as someone who likes to read about history and and these authors and what they, how they communicated, it, it, it just breaks me when I hear that, oh, they burned all this stuff so nobody would know. And, and I get you know, they don't want their private lives exposed to everything. But you know, as as a lover of history, it's it's like, oh, what was in that letter? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and Charlotte Bronte and Emily Bronte were the same. Many of their letters were burnt. Mm. Um, Charlotte burnt a lot of Emily's letters um, so that the, the world wouldn't view her in a bad light. You know, I think that was mm-hmm. religious, uh, the, the religious conviction. Um, yeah, it is. And, and I wonder, well, I worry these days because we don't write. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, you know, how are we going to be represented to the future? Yeah. Um, yeah. Social media is not always the most accurate re- reflection either. So <laughs> No, it's very ephemeral, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I know they say the hard drive never loses anything, but who's clever enough to get it back? And right. who, you, you, you know, um, and when you send an email and delete it, you know, it's gone to us, hasn't it? To the, unless yeah. you're very clever and you've got the police software or something that you can retrieve it, it's gone. Not to bring the conversation down, but they talk about different things like uh, some kind of a, a EMP bomb. There we go. That can just wipe out electronics, you, you know, mm. just. Oh, right. Oh, dear. <laughs> Yes, and we don't write, you know, we don't use pen and paper now, particularly, mm. uh, which is very sad. Uh, so there won't be boxfuls of letters in somebody's attic that we can dig out and read about. You know, they're not going to be able to read about us like we could read about Elizabeth Gaskell. Yeah. You know, I, oh, I, I'll, I'll share a find with you, actually, which you may find interesting. Okay. Um, when we were renovating the stable block at the Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gaskell's house, we found a letter. Um, it was a very strange letter. It was folded up and it was very badly singed. And, uh, you know, obviously there'd been a fire in there at some point and it was worse for wear with crumbly edges. And it was addressed to my dear William. So we immediately thought it was something to, for William Gaskell, but it was, uh, was addressed to the boy that had come down from Skellif Bridge in the Lake District near Ambleside. Um, to look after the animals that Mrs. Gaskell had a small holding at the back of Plymouth Grove, Elizabeth Gaskell's house. She had cows and ducks and hens and pigs and a horse called Tommy. And this young man who was a farmer's son had come down from Skellith Bridge and um, with his two sisters who were working as servants there, one was a cook, to look after the animals. And this letter from 1853 had survived the fire and was folded up um, between the floorboards and the and the rafters at the Elizabeth Gaskell's house. We're very excited about that. Mm, wow, that's that's amazing. L- love it when you find those treasures like that. <laughs> mm. yeah, yeah, and they do, they, yeah, they do turn up now and again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're very uh, keen to try and, and, and keep the uh, Honoris Field collection that they've just uh, up for sale, that's Bronte and Scott and Burns and Gaskell, you know, whole sort of, collection of uh, artifacts which um, i think the uh, association of literature of museums are trying to get together to to fund 
Uh, okay, that's that's where I was going. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I've distracted you. I do. Apologize. I know. I know. I'm thinking about finding all these treasures. Like, oh wow. <laughs> so, um, so let's let's talk about uh, a little bit about your interest in in Gaskell. Where, what was your what's your history with her? How did you? When did you first read her? I first read her at eighteen. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing A levels and I read Wives and Daughters, which I looked at and thought, wow, that's a thick book. Am I going to like it? And I, I really did. I thought it was excellent. Um, the next one that I read was Mary Barton. And I used, Mer- I love Mary Barton. I just think it's a fabulous book. It's a book of two halves. It's a documentary up to the first 18, the first 18 chapters. And then it's kind of a, a detective story and a trial scene. And it's very drama driven mm-hmm. uh, and, and suspense driven because there's a murder in it, of course. So it's got it's got everything, even if Elizabeth Barrett Browning didn't like it and thought it was clumsy and vulgar. Um, <laughs> so, so I think it's I think it's a fabulous book. And obviously living in on the outskirts of Manchester, as I do, and teaching in schools on the outskirts of Manchester, to look at that for a GCSE, that's 16, our 16 year olds take an exam called GCSE, and they do coursework. And you can you could then choose what you wanted to read with them. We had to do a 19th century text and I did Mary Barton and they loved it. You know, the cellars with the sewer sewage running down the walls and people stepping in it in the pavement. You know, kids love that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this poor family who can't feed their, fa- you know, these poor people who can't feed their families. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's just... And, and the, the thing about it is, it's Manchester. You can see the places in Manchester. The Hume Church is still there. The Mechanics Institute is still there. Mm-hmm. Um, Store Street, just off Piccadilly Station, which is Berry Street, which is what she writes about, is still there. Um, so the Ancolts um, is still there. You know, Nicholas Street in Ancolts, it's modern office blocks now. But, you know, you can locate yourself within the city uh, just by reading the book and see how the city was and how the city is. And I just think that's that's fabulous. You know, it's a it's a fabulous book. Um, I really like that. And and people really, uh, really like it, too, because of its connection with where they are, you know. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Gaskell had a wonderful sense of place. In fact, Place almost became a character in her novels. Um, I'm reading Lois the Witch and the beginning is set in Barford, which is in Warwickshire. And I just found that she went to school, you know, she went to school in Stratford-on-Avon, but before the school moved to Stratford-on-Avon, she actually lived for three years in Barford, which is the, the setting at the beginning of, of Lois the Witch. And so the descriptions in there are real. She's talking about what she saw when she was mm-hmm. there in 1824. Yeah, I like I told you before we hit record, I, I've been reading Lois the Witch. Uh, started, I, I read, I think the first part last night uh, or yesterday. Anyway, <laughs> but that just that opening paragraph was was so descriptive and, and beautifully mm-hmm. written. I I'm like, yeah. man, that almost to me, it almost feels like I'm watching a movie which would have baffled her I suppose but it, it's just so well detailed and explained I could see it perfectly in my mind well, well she'd lived uh, there using, she'd actually yeah. lived there and uh, that probably explains why it's so real and of course I don't know where you are in in um, the US but um, she sets the the next part of the book in Salem which is Massachusetts that's mm-hmm. east coast isn't it you know yeah yeah, yeah I'm, I'm central um, in Iowa I'm right in the middle of the U.S. So a lot of, a lot of prairie land out here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, no, I don't think she went, you know, I don't think she was involved in anywhere as far um, east as that, but uh, west as that, sorry. But she did have a friend who came from Boston, so she knew quite a lot of people who were from that part of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, I believe, she was from that part of the world, wasn't she? Yeah, so. yeah, Yeah, she came to stay at uh, Plymouth Grove. So she visited Elizabeth Gaskell in 1857 and stayed at the the house. Um, So, of course, she was an abolitionist and Elizabeth Gaskell was uh, believed very much in uh, freeing the slaves, of course. So, yeah. um, So, yeah, so she had quite a lot of connections. And I think 
Charles Elliot Norton was from that part of the world as well. So it was like East Coast, Massachusetts, and that area was quite important. Yeah, a lot of literary influence from over there. Yeah. Where should someone start reading Gaskell? Like what, what work would you recommend? You know, I've, I've never read a Gaskell before. What should I start with? Well, I'd answer that question because I, I, I would say Mary Barton. Mm -hmm. because I think that's probably the most accessible and the most interesting because it's it's sort of set very really in Manchester, in her city where she lived and telling about what she experienced. I think North and South is a better book, actually. It's a more balanced book than Mary Barton, which is quite one-sided, and she did get quite a lot of... um, uh, quite a lot of criticism about that from her peers, the mill owners who didn't like what she'd said about them. Um, mm. One of the Greggs, uh, William Rathbone Gregg, um, trounced it quite badly in the reviews. But Samuel Gregg of Bollington, who was a friend of Gaskell's, he he supported her. So there was there was I I, I said I, I call it the book that divided a nation. You know, there was <laughs> those that loved it and those that hated it. So yeah. I would go with Mary Barton. It's very yeah. difficult to say which you like the best and where you would start. I would certainly right. start with the industrial novels. But if you like Gothic, go for those two stories that you're doing because they are just fabulous. Mm. I think um, we, we did a recording, a, a dramatic, a dramatised reading of The Old Nurse's Tale, which is on our website somewhere. Um, and we performed it at the house. We got quite a lot of volunteers involved. It was absolute fun to do. It was really fun to do. Um, I'm working on Mr. Harrison's confession next, playing it as vaudeville, because that's quite funny, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I just love those tales. Those are just fabulous. Oh, yeah. I, I'd read The Old Nurse's uh, Tale before, and then I think I may, may have even read it a couple of times, but then reading it for the podcast, you know, I really had to slow down and read it, and then I'm listening to it again as I'm editing, and mm. I'm like, this this story is it's scaring the daylights out of me. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is so well written. It's so good. Yeah, it is good. It's a good, it is a very good story. Yeah. And she had a penchant for ghost stories. She loved telling ghost stories. Charlotte Bronte couldn't listen to her because she was such a good storyteller. Mm. Uh, she had the, uh, Anne Thackeray Ritchie uh, writes about her talent as a storyteller and she had everybody enthralled. And you can see that, can't you, when you mm-hmm. read these mm-hmm. stories. Um, Dickens stole one offer Uh-oh. and published it as his own, which she was very cross about. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a Dickens story I haven't heard of, I don't think. <laughs> Can't remember what it's called, but um, no, I can email you and you can, uh, if, if, you, if you're interested, yeah. I've got it on, I've got it on record somewhere, but I can't just remember offhand what it's called. Yeah, boy, that's that, that little scoundrel. <laughs> it was one, it was one of her after dinner moments, you know, one of her after, di- after dinner tales and Dickens. Mm-hmm stole it and published it hmm. yeah she was very cross <laughs> well I, I would be too yeah <laughs> he can write his own <laughs> I, I was going to ask you uh about the gray woman uh as i'm reading that right now and and i think this episode will probably come when i'm when I, we're done reading the the third part but is is she writing how, how am i trying to explain this it it's it's because that the whole thing about the gray woman is that she's in this marriage that you know basically her husband's trying to kill her and and mm-hmm. she's at risk is she writing about some of the fears perhaps that uh, women had at that time about marriage uh, or about abandonment even well yes i i would uh, I, I think that's exactly what she's writing about see she was more free to say things in the short stories because there were less expectations the, the novel was becoming realist um, mm-hmm. through the 19th century. And so in the short stories, she had more of an opportunity to be rather more imaginative than realist. So mm-hmm. there's, there's more symbolism in that. I mean, I just love this idea where, have you got up to the bit where she's under the table and uh, the husband comes in with the with the bandits, the chauffeurs, and um, she has mm-hmm. to hide under the table and she's touching this corpse that they've kicked under the table. Right. And the symbolism right. there of the of the woman who is in contact with this, you know, is one and, one and the same with this, united with this corpse, and she's the grey woman, and you've got all these ideas of women losing their identity, becoming dead in marriage, 
it comes out in that symbolism and then she takes a chunk she bites her arm a hand i think it is because she's so frightened she actually takes a a piece out of her own hand which i think is quite mm -hmm. grotesque in, yeah. in a way. So, so it's a really strong symbolism of the work the woman loses herself loses her identity in marriage and becomes you know becomes the property of her husband can do anything that he likes because legally the only thing he can't do is kill her right i especially that first part when i was i was reading it and thinking about it uh you know when she first gets married it basically what i, I think what we have there is, is you know, gaslighting, you know, where mm. she doesn't really like this guy who's paying her attention, but then the family is like, you yeah. know, oh, don't be rude, you know, take his gifts, take all that. And then, so she did. And then when she gets, when he proposes and she's thinking, she wants to say no, but then the family's like, well, if you didn't want to marry him, why were you acting that way? And, and I just wanted to yell because you told her to. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, the step stepmother wants to get rid of her, doesn't she? Yeah. And, um, and the and the guys, the 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 the, um, the count is obviously wealthy. You know, he's got a chateau up in La Roche, and um, mm. you know, it's a good way. Of getting, she's marrying her off in, in a suitable, in terms of Victorian dynastic marriages, suitable marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's interesting about Gaskell is you see this throughout her work. Throughout her work, she's interested in surfaces and depths. And the guy looks very charming, doesn't he? You know, mm -hmm. he's uh, he looks he, he's, he's he's sort of attractive to start with. But underneath that, you can see this something there that's unpleasant and menacing, which the girl is repulsed by. And this idea yeah. of surfaces yeah. and depths is is some, is very Gaskell. Mm -hmm. um so i i just i think that's just amazing and and she's really looking at the fact that women have no choice uh she had no no choice and and then i i was getting you know getting scared for her because then he he takes her far away from her family he cuts off contact with her family he you know and then he he's super charming to her one minute and then he completely loses his temper the next and this this to me, this makes this story very relevant today because we, yeah. we know people who are in toxic relationships like that and it's not healthy uh, and it's dangerous for the for the woman, especially. And it's it's sad that nothing in our seems like our society hasn't really changed. <laughs> no, since. no, that's 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 worrying. Yeah, it's worrying. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, she was quite she wasn't a feminist as mm -hmm. we would as we would term it now but she didn't believe in men tyrannizing over women. Mm, yeah. You know, she, she, she saw women as, um, she, she, she thought, well, but, but I think that was a religion anyway. She wanted women to be independent, you know, but they still should be feminine and do, you know, the right thing by their family. So that mm -hmm. would be how she would, would see it. You know, your family, the, your, your daughters, your children, they kind of come first before you're writing um but she she didn't see women should be tyrannized over by men she thought that was wrong she signs a petition about that and i think it's 1856 mm -hmm. um that her friend eliza fox uh, sends to her from london to sign and eliza fox was um somewhat of an active um feminist in our, you know in, in in inverted commas and uh, elizabeth signs it yeah. but she says i don't think it'll do any good but i'll sign it because i don't think women should be tyrannized over by men i'm paraphrasing yeah. that but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah and and so then for that she's called a heretic huh <laughs> <laughs> no that's because uh, she's a dissenter and they were oh, illegal okay. weren't they like the catholic the roman catholics were illegal until um, was it eight, 1828, the Catholic Emancipation Act and the, the dissenters, their legality didn't come till later than that. This mm -hmm. is why she wasn't allowed to marry William in her own church. They had to marry in the um, in St. John's, the parish church, because it wasn't legal to marry in the Unitarian church. Hmm. So they, they were kind of pariahs, you know. Uh, he couldn't go to university in England. He had to go to Scotland, William, because there was no university that would take other than Anglican students. To, to start thinking about uh, 
wrapping up our conversation. I mean, I could talk all day, but I appreciate the time you're, you're giving me today, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, what they call the desert Island question. You know, that if you were on a desert Island, it could only take one of Gaskell's works, which one would it be? That's, That's again, question. these are very difficult questions, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah. I'd, I'd, pro <laughs> I'd probably, I don't know really, I'd probably take her short stories because of the diversity there and the imaginative impact of those stories. I mean, I mean, just look at that grey woman where she has this, uh, you know, man, woman, husband, maid. Mm -hmm. Have you got to that bit yet where Amante, the... Amante, the, the, the servant, her husband's servant, actually dresses as a man mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they uh, travel as husband and wife. Now, that's very yeah. risky in, oh, in yeah. Victoria. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in the 1860s, it, 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 it is. Yeah. So, yeah, I think they're just so imaginative. I, I, I like her short stories very much, actually. Yeah, yeah. My first one I read of, I, I think it was... Um, North and South uh, might have been one of her short stories, but uh, I think I read short uh, North and South first. I, at least that's the one I remember reading first, and uh, really, really enjoyed that. So then I started. I've been reading a little bit of her here and there, and uh, I just read Mary Barton this past spring and love that. Yeah, it's uh, good. It's good. Like like you've been saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know what I I would. I might be, I might do like your, you and just take a collection of short stories along and, <laughs> and uh, although I'm not sure I'd want to be reading some of her scary ones at night if I'm on the island alone. <laughs> <laughs> or in, uh, her letters are, are, are good, they're good yeah. value. Her letters are very good value. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, when I, I want to ask, I think we've kind of alluded to it a little bit already, but why, why do you think Elizabeth Gaskell matters today? I, I, I believe she does, but her Yeah, writing. I believe she does. I believe she's mattering more, to be perfectly honest. Um, mm -hmm. She wasn't particularly well received in the early 20th century. I think people felt that she was, I'm going to use a term I love to do, fluff, very fluffy. You know, she was a Victorian wife who didn't really know what was going on. Uh, she sat in the drawing room and uh, and didn't uh, really mix with the outside world, which is completely false, absolutely false. And I also think that because her works are quite, this may, this sounds as I'm belittling, belittling them a bit, doesn't it? But easy to read. I mean, I think they are quite easy to read. Um, you know, there's no sort of complexity on the surface. But once you start reading them, I think they're extremely complex underneath and they deal with issues that are quite relevant today, like um, masters and men, you know, industrial relations, like the way we treat people. Um, I think that's important because she didn't see the workers as a as a mass force that was a threat to society, you know, or the structure of society. She saw them as individuals and she appreciated their humanity. And I think you, you see her more or less saying to a reader, you know, these people are, are people like you are and you need to understand them. And once you understand that, the problem will not be the problem that you think it is. Um, so I think that's quite important um, today. I also think the way in which she writes about women is very relevant. I think we've talked about that, haven't we, earlier on, that she's, you know, she, she shows women just what it's like to make inappropriate marriages you know there are a lot and, and women as you say people today still are making inappropriate marriages um and the problems that that causes for them and for the women who do this um she's asking people to be careful really and and weigh up the pros and cons of a marriage emotionally um as well as materially before you you take that that leap you know, and get to know people, get to know people, know people, I think is something that's, um, that's important to her. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I can see that, especially in North and South. I mean, that's a, uh, that, that whole idea that, you know, these are people and get to know them. And uh, as, I, as I remember, that's, that's kind of one of those uh, themes in that book. Yeah. 
I'm going to ask uh, one more here. I'm kind of putting you on the spot with this one, Go but on. uh, do, uh, what's a, a good book to read about Elizabeth Gaskell? Do you have any, if we want to read more about her life, any good recommendations? Uh, yeah, I've been asked this question before. I mean, Jenny okay. Uglo is, is obviously the definitive biography of, of Elizabeth Gaskell. My problem with Jenny Uglo's biography is, is the fact that it jumps about in time. So if you, mm -hmm. you know, if you're chronologically not secure in, in Elizabeth's life, that might be a little bit problematic for you. Um, mm -hmm. Winifred Gerin, Gerin, Gerin uh, wrote one earlier than that, which is quite readable and considerably shorter than Jenny Uglo's. Um, but I think this is out of print now, unfortunately, but there's a very short one by Alan Shelston. I think it's in a series called Writer's Lives. Now, Alan Shelston was my supervisor at university for my MA, and he was the chair of the Gaskell Society for a while. He's quite old now, but he's a good writer, and that's very, very readable and, and very short. But I'm not sure if it's out of print in Britain now. I don't know about over there, uh, whether you can get that or not. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. so Winifred Gerin's old biography, but it's not inaccurate and it's considerably mm -hmm. say, shorter than Jenny Uglow's, but that's the defin definitive one, but it jumps in time. And I think that's a little bit difficult sometimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm reading um, Jen Uglow's one right now. Um, I, I mean, I just started, you know, I'm about 200 pages in, but yeah, I've noticed that it's, it's kind of jumping around and flits about, doesn't it? And it's hard to follow the continuity, the chronology of her life. Uh, so it's really, really hard to follow that, which I, I, I think is a shame because it's quite well researched on the whole and very detailed. Yeah. Hardback, so I'm getting a workout lifting it up to read. You know, it's it's quite yeah. A brick, I've got it but... in hardback as well. But when she talk when she talks about Plymouth Grove belonging to some ancient invalid, that's completely wrong. And she's she's got that from Mrs. Chadwick's biography of Elizabeth Gaskell, and and that's not the correct information at all. It's funny how some bio, some people, you know, you just lift information from one biography mm -hmm. to another without kind of checking. Mm -hmm checking it all right so i guess uh last thing again thank you for joining me today on, That's quite on all the right. podcast and uh where can people find you online if they have any questions or if they want to reach out to the society or the house well um, uh, our society obviously um has a contact contact details it, the, the website is manned by lindsay parkinson who um sent me your details when okay. you, you you contacted the society via their website didn't mm -hmm. you yep. yeah yep. um so if anybody wants to ask i mean i don't mind if people have my email address if it's a, a reasonably good question about if they want information about elizabeth gaskell i'm very happy to share okay mm -hmm. you have my email address i, I do so yep. if, if anybody wants to contact me i'm quite happy for you to give them my email address and they can contact me direct okay if they want to contact the house they you know we have contact details on the house website if they want to contact the elizabeth gaskell house um but most inquiries are sent to me anyway <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I tend to get so. those. I've, I've got another interview, I think, next week with a lady um, from Britain somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, mm -hmm. Kate, who wants to talk about the house and volunteering at the house and Gaskell and her work and her life, you know, so oh, a busy, busy two weeks here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had this sudden interest in Gaskell. Yeah. <laughs> In the meantime, again, thank you for uh, coming on and uh, I've enjoyed it. it. It's been it's been good. I like talking about Miss Gaskell, as you can um, you probably noticed. Oh, yeah, uh, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. and, and I love talking about literature and and writing and you know. So I'm I'm yeah. quite happy to do that. I've really enjoyed it, and I hope some of your listeners over there will be uh, keen to read more and perhaps mm -hmm. find out more about. Elizabeth and her contemporaries, because Elizabeth had an awful lot of writing 
you know, friends who were writers, Geraldine Dewsbury, Frederica mm -hmm. Bremer, the Swedish novelist, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Charlotte Bronte, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, she communicated with, George Eliot, she communicated with. So this whole wow. sort of, uh, yeah, a whole sort of correspondence, a literary um, women, this is apart from Thackeray mm -hmm. and uh, Dickens, um, John Forster and the sort of men, uh, some of the male writers uh, of the time, but particularly the women. And George Eliot writes about how she loves this sort of sympathy that Elizabeth Gaskell has with this community of women. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's such a lot of her contemporaries that um, she interacted with, and therefore she's very important in the in the literature of the period, I think. Yeah, so I enjoy yeah. talking yeah. about that, yeah. There's... A lot about her life I, I haven't learned yet. So this is this is helpful on, on my journey as I learn more about her and her writing. So well, I'm happy to talk to you about that at some other time then if All you right. <laughs> <laughs> well if I have any any good questions, I'll I'll shoot them off to you. So <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again for joining and uh, you you take care. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you so much for sticking through this episode. I hope you enjoyed the story today and enjoyed the interview. Stay tuned for next week. We are changing gears and we are traveling now from the Victorian age all the way to modern times. Next week, I will have an interview with author Naomi Kritzer. She has just recently written a Hugo nominated short story called Little Free Library. She is also the author of Cat Pictures, Please in other wonderful short stories, and has a couple of books coming out. So the next episode, I'm also not sure if I will have a story on for that one or take a little break from reading the story, but we'll have we'll have a few other things in the episode uh, as well that I'm planning, um, hopefully. So uh, go ahead and check it out, and then we'll get back to the stories and uh, in interviews. I've got a, a poet I'll be talking to this next month, possibly two of them. Uh, I, I I love poetry, but I love to learn more about about it. So I'm gonna have a couple poets on. Lots of fun stuff coming up. I hope to see you here again. Remember to read good books and do good things. Be kind and take care.